adelante. Listen, uh, real quick before we uh, get into the word and so forth, uh, the young adults have attended a, a conference this uh, yesterday or the day before. So I'm going to have, where's Erica, Ciara, where are you guys at? Come on up real quick. Why don't you guys share a little bit about what happened at that conference, you guys? It was a young adults conference that they attended uh, in, in Gilbert. Was it Gilbert or Chandler? Oh, okay, so I have a different message because right now when we're in worship, the Lord just reminded me of dry bones. And a lot of us have dry bones in our life, and there's a lot of dead things in our life. And the Lord has just, like, reminded me, like, we need to speak to those dead things to come alive. You know, whether it be dead dreams or, you know, dead hope, like, we need to speak to those things to come alive. So that was not my message, but what I got from the thing was... Um, we are to make disciples of the unbelievers because us as believers, um, we're supposed to go out there and share the gospel. And some of us might be too shy to share it or some of us might be like, oh, what are they going to think of me? But we are to be bold and share what, what the God has put in us. And um, basically, yeah, like it says in Matthews, let me see, Matthews 28, 18, it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have, been, I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach, them, teach these new disciples to obey the commands I have given you, and be sure of this. I am always with you till the end of the earth. So us as believers are to go out there and make disciples of all nations, because your one life can impact thousands, and that's how you grow in grace. Or, where did it go? Oh, well, that's how you grow in grace. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, what I got from the pop-up, um, there was this pastor, his name's Reggie, and he just continuously talked about obedience and just um, obeying the call to your life, and I feel like that really spoke to me because for the longest time, um, I asked for God to, you know, um, tell me what he wants me to do in his life, and in my life, lead me and just show me, and like, I've, I've been wanting to hear his voice in my life, and um, I realized that um, because of he was talking about, um, God speaks to us in so many ways that we don't even realize, and God speaks to us even in our mundane things that we do. He calls us to do the simplest of things in our lives, and we ignore it. We ignore that call because we think, oh, God, that's too simple for us to do. Give me something better. Well, first, you have to do the small thing in order to do the bigger thing, and I really feel like that really spoke to me because I have a hard time doing the mundane things when that is where I need to start in order to get to the big things that he has planned for my life. Just speak life to those dry bones and whoever that message is for, but just speak life to those dry bones is what I got to say. Amen. 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 Lucy number two. <laughs> Praise God. That's awesome, guys. Awesome. Praise God. Thank you, Eric, for having them uh, meet there and for the young adults. Amen. I know, I know uh, there's a pastor uh, that's helping us with the landscaping, and he has a church there in El Mirage, and he was asking about the youth, too, if how they, you know, something to get involved. I said, well, bring them to the G1 Friday night. If they need a, another youth group to go to and stuff like that, bring them there and uh, get them involved and so forth, you know, because they're looking for other youth that want to serve God and want to do God's will, so... It's exciting. So God is, you know, again, like I spoke last week, building relationships to, to be a blessing in the kingdom of God. I'm going to switch over, guys, to, to the mic. All right. Amen. Let's see. Am I on? Can you hear me? All right. But, but thank God. You know, God is so good. He's, he's reaching. That's why, you know, I'm, I'm of course, trying to move as much to... Um, get this building going and everything there's some you know you know how contractors sometimes they'll tell you well we're, we'll do it this but you know well this came up and <laughs> like you know that's the way it is I, I should be used to it now I should be used to it but anyway so hopefully they're gonna start this uh, week Amen. and because uh, next Tuesday I already set up the schedule for the plumber and the electrician to do the underground stuff so we got to have that pad and the, and the footing already dug by next week. So anyway, believe God with us that, you know, the contractors will 
be able to stick. And I've, and I've prayed and believe in God, so it, that it'll keep going through. So we can get moving forward and get the building. And then after the foundation is done, we're just, we'll be waiting. Uh, we already ordered the building, so we're just waiting for the building to be manufactured. It's a steel building. They manufacture it, and you kind of put it together like a puzzle. And we have a you know, company that's going to do that. So, so once we get the, fo uh, the foundation in, we'll be ready. Just wait for the building. And once the building up, then we'll start working on the inside and so forth. So that's the cool thing with the building. Once you get it up, the exterior pretty much is done. And, uh, just put, and we just got to put the windows and all that. So it'll, it'll get there. Little by little, it'll get there. Amen? But let's pray. We're going to get right into the Word. Uh, I believe I'm excited today. Kind of goes along with what our sister was sharing there. But Father... As we get into your word this morning, again, we just look to you. We trust in you, Father, for the Holy Spirit to give us utterance, to give us ears to hear what your Spirit is saying through your word. And Father, I just thank you. I put my trust in you to speak those things you want me to speak. And Lord, help us to get a greater revelation and understanding of the simple gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen? So listen, we've been talking about God's purposes for your life. And we've already covered God's purpose for you was to be in His grace. That's your position in Christ. So that was always God's purpose for you to abide in Christ. Listen, when you know who you are in Christ, your position in Christ, no matter like what we were saying about the storm or whatever, you'll, you'll stay steady. You'll be consistent. You'll, you know, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. He changes not. So that's why it says you should, you should, there should be a consistency within you. Why? Because Jesus lives in you. So if Jesus is really in your life, he'll build within you a consistency to stick with it and so forth. So your position in Christ does not change, no matter your circumstances. No matter if you fail, your position in Christ does not change. A lot of Christians don't believe that. Some Christians believe that when they sin, that they're not righteous anymore. Well, listen, you're going to be in a, in a world of trouble because it, some people think you jump in and out of righteousness. No, 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 no. When you rece receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you have become the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, are there consequences for your failures and your sins? We know that. There's plenty of natural consequences for your sins. Amen? Amen? There's, but Jesus paid for that. Jesus took care of that. So it's not God turning away from you. It's a lot of times it's you turning away from God because you feel guilty. But, but the Bible says you're still the righteousness of God in Christ. So when you do mess up, you run to God. No run away from Him. He, your position in Christ doesn't change. If my son is my true son, if he were to, you know, uh, do something against me or whatever, that doesn't, his position as my son does not change. If he's truly my son, that will never change. Come on now, let me tell you something. Amen. That will never change. Amen. So position, so if you understand, live your life in your position in Christ, who you are in Christ. Don't live your life out of your circumstances because if you do, you'll be an up and down yo-yo Christian. Right? And then we talked about God's purpose for you to, to grow in His grace. And so it's so important that God wants us to grow. Now, in your spirit, you don't grow. In your spirit, you got the spirit of Christ. you got, you got the spirit of Christ within you, you that lives within you. And you have the, the same faith that Jesus has, the peace of God on the inside of you. That doesn't change. But, but releasing the power of God and the grace of God inside of you to the outside, that's where it takes growth. And that's where you grow. You grow in your soul, in, 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 in allowing the word to, to flow out of your spirit into your soul, your mind. Are, are the monitors off? No. They're off? Okay. Maybe just a... Okay, just a tad. So, uh, um, yeah, I don't know. We shouldn't be getting any ringing on this. But anyway, can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Anyway, so what I was talking about, what was I talking about? <laughs> Growing in grace, as you grow, amen, as you grow, uh, oh, by the way, let's get rid of the elephant in the room. What do you think? <laughs> Back in the 50s. Just get it out, just get it out. Back in the 50s. Amen. Anyway, I got one little girl gave me a compliment. He looks good, so. <laughs> what else am I talking about? What do you mean my... <laughs> my hair. <laughs> okay. So I just wanted to go back to the 50s for a while. My hair grew. My hair grew black. 
So anyway, growing in grace. So, so that's vital. God wants us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. And then we, last week we talked about God's purpose for you to share or fellowship, share the grace of God within you. See, a tree will produce fruit, but how many know fruit is for others to partake? Amen. They come and partake of your love, your joy, your peace. So God wants us to be fruitful so we can be a blessing to others. And they can partake. And then there's other fruit that what? That uh, it, things that we produce that die. And, and, and we get, and here's the thing. When we really mature is when we reproduce. And that's what I want to talk about today. Because uh, it's just not multiplying. Uh, we're talking about our growth, our fruitfulness. But multiplying is, is the ultimate goal, like our sister said. God wants us to what? Go and make disciples. And, 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 and in other words, reproduce ourselves in other people's lives. That's the ultimate goal. Otherwise, why are we still here? Let's get saved and go to heaven. God has us here so we can, what? Be fruitful and multiply. So we can reach our family, our kids, so they all may know Jesus Christ. Amen? So that's what I want to talk about today. God's purpose for you is to serve by His grace. And, you might, and those of you that have your notes, you have it in front of you. This is dealing with your multiplying in Christ. Let's look at two areas where He wants us to serve Him by His grace. The first one is in ministering to one another. In ministering to one another. So God's purpose for us is to serve by His grace in ministering to one another. I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. I've been, I, I preach a lot from the pulpit here that I believe we're living in the last days before the return of the Lord Jesus, right? And so notice, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. So God wants us to be serious and watchful, what? In our prayers. So in the, in the last days, again, we're, 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 we had prayer this morning. Worship is a type of prayer. Did you know worship is one of the main types of prayer? Amen? So, so we're, we're doing what he says there. Be serious and watchful. In, prayer is not just asking God for things. Come on. Prayer is really a relationship, communion with God, having a relationship with God. You're worshiping Him. You're ministering to Him. He ministers to you. And so, and so notice, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Let's keep reading. And above all things, have... So I would, I would like to say that last verse then deals with growing in grace, right? And then the, and notice, and here's, here's sharing His grace. And, have, and, and above all things, have fervent love for... We talked about the one another's last week. For one another, for love will cover what? A multitude of sins. Now notice, why would he say that? Because in the last days, sin is going to abound. And where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Where sin abounds, grace is going to abound much more. Why? There's so much sin. Amen? Uh, the world is calling evil good and good evil. Amen? It's, I, I mean, my heart is it's sad when I hear of ministries and even some pastors that are actually given in to the culture and changing and saying that this is okay, that some of the stuff that the world's saying is okay today is okay. If it, no, if, it, if the word says it's not okay, it's not okay. Amen? See, you can still love the sinner, but not like the sin or hate the sin. Amen? You can still love the sinner and still hate the sin. Come on, it's true. Amen? I love my, my son and my, my kids and my grandkids. That doesn't mean I like the, any, if they do any bad stuff that I have to like what they do or approve of what they do. Amen? And so, and so we're living in days that we need to stick with the word. But notice, above all things, have fervent love for one another because cause love covers a multitude of sins. A lot of grace. Now look at the next verse. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. That still deals with what? Sharing is grace. But here's what I want to get to today, and I'm going to talk about today, and here it is, the next verse. As each one has received, what, a gift, minister it to, what, one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God, or the different varieties of God's grace gifts. So notice, notice, here's the part that I'm talking about, serving by His grace. This is the part where God wants us to multiply in. And so I want you to put that, uh, verse 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. 
to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's look at this in the TPT. Look at this. I like the way it says it. Since we are approaching the end of all things, be intentional, purposeful. That's what we've been talking about, the purposes of God. And be self-controlled so that you can be given to prayer. Above all, constantly echo God's intense love for one another. For love will be a canopy over a multitude of sins. Be compassionate to foreigners without complaining. Notice, every believer has received what? Grace, Grace gifts. I like it. Every believer has received what? Grace. grace gifts. Use them, use your grace gifts to what? Serve one another as faithful stewards of the many colored tapestry of God's grace. Have you seen a tapestry or a you know, blanket that's been made and whatever? You see all the different colors? And he's saying we're, we're, we're like, we're, we're, we're hooked up, connected, and we all have our different gifts, our different colors. Amen? And so, and so we all have our unique giftings that God has given each and every one of us. And so notice, for example, if you have a speaking gift, speak as though God were speaking His words through you. If you have the gift of serving, do it passionately with the strength that God gives you. Amen? If you're serving in one of our ministry teams and so forth. Listen, amen? So that in everything, God alone will be glory. What's the end result? So that God alone... See, it's all by, It's a grace gift. Mean, grace means it's undeserved. It's unearned. It's unmerited. But God bestows it to you. It's a, he, he empowers you. He gives you the ability. I can't take glory for the teaching gift that He's given me. I, I can't get into pride or anything. Why? Because it's a gift. And really, it's a gift for you. Amen. It's not for me. It's for you. Amen. As a pastor, He's gifted me for that purpose to be able to teach you it's a gift i recognize so i can get puffed up and pride about it why because it's god's gift from him to you to teach you in the same way god's graced you and give you grace gifts so that you can what be a blessing but you don't get any glory god gives you so that in everything god alone will be glorified through jesus christ for to him belong the power and the glory forever throughout all ages amen are you seeing that? So, so the end of things is all hands, so what should we be doing? We should be ministering these grace gifts to one another. And that's why, you know, we have different teams where people can serve. Now listen, let's look at Romans 12, 6 through 8. It explains the grace gifts even further, but uh, th these are more life gifts that God has given you. And, and I'm going to put it in the TPT because of time. Look at this. God's marvelous grace imparts to each one of us varying gifts and ministries that are uniquely ours. See, we all have our unique gifts. So if God has given you the grace gift of prophecy, you must activate your gift by using the proportion of faith you have to prophesy. If your grace gift is serving, then thrive in serving others well. If you have the grace gift of teaching, then be actively teaching and training others. If you have the grace gift of encouragement, are you seeing these different gifts? There, there's people that are just great to exhort. exhort. One, in fact, I, I believe Joel Osteen is one of those. That's one of his gifts. He is an exhorter. He can tell you a story, and then he'll exhort from it. He's a great exhorter. That's why a lot of people will listen to him, even unbelievers. Why? Because all his messages edify and built up. Amen. He's not ministering as an evangelist. Amen? An evangelist will be more in your face. You big disgrace. I have to throw one in there. Right? Have, that's why, see, God gives, that's why people, people are different, different personalities. Amen? Amen? The person is more, in fact, let's, let's keep reading, I'll, tell you, I'll get to that one. If you have the grace gift of giving, see, some of you are gifted to make money so that you can be a blessing, not just to your family, but to the kingdom of God. Yeah. You're anointed to start businesses and be a blessing to the kingdom of God. That's your grace gift. You're generous. You love to give. Yeah. Amen? Some of you have that grace gift. You can use it for the kingdom of God. If I wasn't pastoring, I'd probably be building homes. Amen? Be many, many homes. <laughs> Remember that little, whatever little Manny, what, the, what was his name? Bob Manny? Bob, 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 but there was another one, Bob the Builder and the other one, Manny. Oh, huh? Handy Manny. Handy Manny. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, so listen, if you have the grace gift of giving to meet the needs of others, 
then, you, then may you prosper in your generosity without any fanfare. In other words, you're not showing off. You gave a 10,000 check and, hey, hey, here's a 10,000 check. You're not showing off. You're just giving it. Amen. And I've noticed people that are like that, they are not like that. They're not like, hey, look, I wrote a check. They just, under the, you know, they don't want to, you know. You can tell that's their gift. If you have the gift of leadership, amen, you're good at putting, you know, uh, putting people in line, getting them in line and stuff like that, uh, come, come on, right? Then that's your gift. Be passionate about your leadership. And if you have the gift of showing compassion, then flourish in your cheerful display of compassion. So in other words, you're the merciful one. It, 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 isn't it funny? You can have somebody that comes up and let's say they're dealing with drugs, they come up and, 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 and they're asking for help and whatever. Well, you can see the different grace gifts operating. Th those that are more prophetic will come up Man, you need to give it up, man. You need to give it up. Come on, you need to give it up. But then the more merciful person can will come, ay, pobrecito, it's okay. The Lord is going to help you. It's all right. Come on, you just got to. The exhorter, you're going to make it, man. You're going to make it. You're going to get through this. You're going you're gonna to make it to the other side of the storm. Right? Right? You know what I'm saying? The giver, he'll come here, man. Here, I need to, he, I'm going to get a place for you to, come on. Right? The giver will do that. You see that, amen? You see, you see the different gifts operating in people through the way they react. And that's why some people, how come they're so, hi, they're so, hijuela. <laughs> you know, you know the, the, the teacher will have, I have a five-step plan to get you out of those drugs. <laughs> First, five steps, brother, to get deliverance from those, five steps. <laughs> right? Those are the different gifts, right? Again, the, 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 the evangelist, first you need to be saved, brother. Jesus will deliver you from that. Let go on the drugs. The evangelist, right? Again, the merciful person. Ay, pobrecito, no me voy a The prophet guy wants to slap him. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Thus saith the Lord, let go of thy weakness. You know, whatever. <laughs> See what I'm saying? And, and people are like, how come they're like that? How come like that? that that's the gifting in their lives. They're, some are prophetic, some are more uh, leadership. You know, you've been somewhere, and you know, have you noticed, Pastor Lucy, if you've been somewhere, come on, line up, give up. <laughs> Administrative leadership. <laughs> right? That's the gift coming out. Amen. The, uh, those of you that are, don't have that, they're like, whatever. <laughs> what line? <laughs> you know, what line? Get in line! <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like the story one time. I like the story one time. Uh, uh, I think Ken Lake said this one story one time. Let's say you're in a table around and, and you have a little boy named Jimmy. And he goes to eat dinner at a table and there's soup that was given to anyone. And Jimmy goes to sit down, and he drops his bowl of soup, spills it. And you can see the reaction of different people where their gifting is. Again, the prophet will stand up and say, I had a feeling that something was going to happen today. <laughs> I just sensed it. I knew that something was going to happen. Right? And then the, gift, the one with the gift of serving, oh, oh, get, get some rags, get some rags. Starts cleaning. Oh, no, no, the person with leadership, somebody go bring me some rags, somebody go bring. And the person with serving will be cleaning up and so forth. The, the merciful one, it's okay, Jimmy, I'll give you my soup. <laughs> right? Isn't it true? You, ha you see it in your family. Which ones are the merciful? Which ones are the compact? Which ones are the leaders? And so forth. Hanali, get in the picture. Hurry up. I want to take the picture. Before something bad happens, the prophetic one. Right? And then the, the giver, oh, that's okay, Jimmy, here you go. Here's some money. You can buy all the soup you want. In fact, I, don't, I didn't even want the soup anyway. Just take mine, Jimmy. That's the giver. Are you seeing what we think is they're weird? Or why are they acting like this? Is actually a grace gift in each individual. Flowing through each individual. And so God says, take those grace gifts and minister those grace gifts to one another. So find out 
We do have a little thing if you become, in fact, if those of you who come to the pizza with the pastors, we have a little form in the back that will kind of give you an idea to locate what your grace gift is. Amen. So we have, the, we have you take, it's a simple one page, and then the answers are there. Just answering a few things to find out what, what your grace gift, what life gift you have. Really, these here in Romans 12 are motivational gifts, what God has already placed in you. Amen. Amen. And listen, a lot of times you have more than one grace gift. Yeah. Amen. More than, uh, I know mine, and the major one is teaching with me, but I'm also an exhort. I like to exhort too. I'm also very compassionate sometimes, you know, and, and, and so forth. That's why Pastor Lucy says I give a lot of stuff away. And she's like, nope, she's the administrator. Nope, 10 bucks. <laughs> I buck. <laughs> Let's go to 20. That's why when they're trying to sell the burritos, God, what do you want to sell it for? Two bucks. It's five. <laughs> but we all balance each other out. Otherwise, bur burritos are free if I do it, and we're not going to make any money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> right? So, see how important these are? I don't have time to study more in this area, but I just want to throw you, that as we're going to, if we're going to serve God by His grace, there's two areas. One, ministering to others with the grace gifts God has given us. But here's the one I want to get to focus the rest of the time, and this is the one I'm excited about, because I think this is the one we need to really, really focus on in these last days. Here it is, in sharing the gospel of grace to the lost. In sharing the gospel of grace to the lost. I want you to go to Acts 20:24. 20, this is the mission of our church. This is, this is why we are here. Amen? Not just to grow, not just to share, but to serve by getting the gospel out and ministering one another, but also sharing the gospel of grace. Listen, I like what Paul says because in the previous verse, he says, everywhere I go, the Holy Ghost is testifying that trials and tribulations await me. But look at verse 24. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. Listen, we all have a race to run. We all have an individual race that God has called us to run. Amen? Amen? We, have, we all have a course for our life. Sometimes we can get off course, but all you have to do when you, when you take a rabbit trail is come back to the course and get back. And so notice, but, he, he, so I think he's bringing two things out here. That, so that I may finish my race with joy. I, I, I believe that's his individual race. But then ministry. Notice the course God has for your life, but also the ministry. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus. And what is it, Paul said? To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I remember reading that verse earlier, you know, in, in, in years ago and everything. And as I read it, it hit me just like it must have hit Paul. And I says. It's like the Lord's speaking to me. That's your mission, son. That's your mission. That, just like Paul's, that's your mission. That's, that's the church's mission here. To, to testify to the gospel of the grace. Why? Because sin is abounding. And where sin abounds, grace has got to abound much more in these last days. In fact, can you put that in the NLT and the TBT for me? Listen to the NLT. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for what? For finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Amen. So notice, he's calling the gospel the good news of the wonderful grace of God. Now the TPT, but whether I live or die is not important, for I don't esteem my life as indispensable. It's more important for me to fulfill my destiny and to finish the ministry. Notice, my destiny, we all have a destiny. And to finish the ministry my Lord Jesus has assigned to me, which is to faithfully preach the wonderful news of God's grace. Amen. The wonderful news the God's, of, of, of God's grace. So, Paul said it was his mission to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. This should be our mission too. It's really the gospel of, of the grace of Christ. It's about Jesus, but it's the gospel about his grace. About how gracious he was that he died for us. We didn't deserve it. It's by grace through faith we're saved and so forth. In fact, Ephesians 3, 2 in the CEB, notice what Paul says here. You've heard, of course, about the responsibility to what? To distribute what? Well, what's that? That's the gospel. 
I'm responsible to distribute God's grace, which God gave to me for you, right? He said. So notice, we are not distributing wonderful news about the grace of Christ. So that's why a lot of times, I, I, I like using that illustration before, mass evangelism or crusade evangelism. Uh, is it eight? Maybe I got the wrong, hold on. I think I went to the wrong. I know, but I think I gave him the wrong. Hold on a second. Where is it that... Um, No, uh, oh yeah, no, eight, eight, six, eight, four, I mean, I'm sorry, it's eight, chapter eight, verse four. Eight, four. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word, and then, all, yeah, all the way through verse uh, four through eight for me. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria, and what did he do? He preached what? Christ. Christ to them. So the gospel, it's about, but we know Paul says it's about the grace of Christ. He preached Christ to them. And listen, and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing, faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word. Hearing and seeing, notice, not just hearing, they saw something. What did they see? Seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed. And many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was what? Great joy. See, when the gospel of the grace of Christ is preached, miracles happen, and there's great joy in the city. Amen? And so there's your mass evangelism. But this same evangelist, Philip, notice what happens. Go now to chapter 8, same chapter. Go down to verse 26. Look at what happens. Look at verse 26. Now the angel of the Lord. Look at verse 26. Now the angel of the Lord. Now he's an evangelist. You would think, I just want to do major crusades, that's it. But no. The angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. He's probably thinking, wow, man, I'm going to go to another town, maybe just like what happened in Samaria. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch, of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, notice how the Holy Spirit is involved in evangelism, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its sharer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. That's Isaiah 53. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. See, so he's reading Isaiah 53, which is what? The chapter that talks about the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our inequities. He took all our sins and all our punishment, and by his stripes we are healed. So, so he's reading about what Jesus would, in the Old Testament, about what Jesus would do. But the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip, come on now, he opened his mouth and beginning at that scripture, what did he do? Come on now. He preached Jesus to him. Hallelujah. He preached Jesus. Listen, when you witness, you're to preach about Jesus. Not your religion. Not necessarily your church. You just preach about Jesus. Amen. Preach about the grace of Christ, what he did for you. Then Philip opened his mouth and began the scripture. He preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, hey, see here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What did he say? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he what? And he baptized him. Next, so, so again, notice, isn't that beautiful? So notice, here's Philip in a big crusade, thousands of, or hundreds of people, whatever, getting saved, healed, or whatever, yet the Spirit of God leads him to do one-on-one -on -one evangelism where you reach one-on-one. -on -one. And listen, you know what statistics have shown? Statistics have shown that 75 or more percent of the people to, that come to Christ came because a friend telling somebody else. Even to church. Coming to church, why? Because a friend invited somebody else. One-on-one -on -one is really the best way to evangelize. If everybody would just, what, just whatever your friend or whatever, just build a relationship with them, and then when the door opens, share, share the good news of, of Jesus Christ with them. It, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. That, and, and I'm going to show you. I'm going to give you a practical way. In fact, this is the way I used to do it when I first was born again. And I was witnessing in the streets of, of uh, Van Buren. Amen. Uh, I, I have it there in your notes there. But what is this message of His grace we are to share with others? Amen. What is this message of grace that we are to share with others? Here it is, the gospel. I'm going to give you the gospel in a nutshell in these verses. Go to 2 Corinthians 5.17 through 6.2. 2 Corinthians 5.17. I remember I would use the NLT uh, uh, for this, but uh, we'll, 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 we'll stay where we're at. But, uh, but this is a scripture I would share out there in the streets because, you know, I only have so much time sometimes with the people, so I want to sow the word. And the Bible says the word will not return void. When you sow the seed, believe that it will not return void. I like what uh, just Jerry Savelle says, and he was a great witnesser. He, would, he, he was during the hippie movement and whatever. He'd be at the beach in California getting thousands of people saved down that beach and whatever when the, during the hippie movement when a lot of them got saved, the hippies got saved. Amen. And uh, he, one of the things he, he, he says, everybody that I share the gospel with, it, I believe they're going to get saved. Every one of them. In fact, he, he's, he gave an example one time. He's, this guy, he's, I don't want to hear it. I don't know how many times people tell him, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. He'd even follow them sometimes. And I don't want to hear it. I don't want to fear it. And so forth. But one time, I think he just shared one scripture with that guy. That if you confess with the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. He just gave him that one verse right there. Just that one verse. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Just that one verse. And, and the guy, is like, he, he told me, let me just give you one verse, one verse. And he let him. He doesn't know he's sowing the seed. And he says, and he says okay, I'm done. And, well, well, what do you mean? I, I, I already know you're going to get saved because I, you know, he sowed the word. So anyway, <laughs> he showed up the next day and the guy comes around Oh, there you are. He says, that scripture's been in my head since you gave it to me and I can't get it out of my head. You want me to pray for you? Yes. Ended up receiving Jesus. Just with one verse of scripture. The power of the word of God. See, but he released his faith that when you sow the word, it's not going to return void. Why? Because God's word is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's, Jesus said, my words are spirit and my words are life. And it's going to cut through the, the garbage. See, they might have philosophies. They might have stuff. But the Word of God is power, more powerful than their thinking. More powerful than philosophy. So let's go to look at this. Now, you might come up with somebody and say, Listen, I want to share with you something that changed my life. Can I share with you some? What? Yeah, what did they say? I got something to change my life. Is it? Really? Yeah, let me show you right here. <laughs> you have to kind of go with the culture. I mean, if you're in the barrio, you kind of have to... Act like the body, hey, amen. <laughs> I got something for you, man. <laughs> it's good. Oh It'll make you sneeze. I don't talk it no more. Tired of getting up on the floor. No, thank you, please. It only make me. Stop it. Look at this. Therefore, listen, man, I got something to share with you. If anyone, did you know that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation? Old things are passed away, and all things become new. What? How? How is that possible? All things are of God, who reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. What do you mean, how? What happened? God was in Christ. What was he doing? He was reconciling the world, including you, to himself. How, though? 
by not imputing or counting your sins or your trespasses against you. And he's committed to me this word that, hey, reconciliation. You know what the word reconciliation means? Making friends of enemies. Yep. Reconciliation is simply making friends of what once was an enemy. Reconcile. You know, just like you get in a fight, an argument, and there's reconciliation. Well, that's what it's simply. So in other words, our job is to make friends of what was once enemies of God. God already what? Reconciled us to himself. God is already our friend. So I'm telling that sinner, hey, listen, I got some great news for you. Put that verse back up. I'm sorry. Let me, let me read. Did you know that God was in Christ? What was he doing? There at the cross. He died on the cross for your sins. Jesus Christ died on the, came and died on the cross. And he was reconciling the world to himself. How? By not counting your trespasses unto them or your sins against you. And, give, and he's given us this word or this message of this reconciliation. And in other words, God, sinner, listen to me, brother. Did you know that God's not counting your sins against you anymore? What do you mean, pastor? God's not counting your sins against you. Yeah, but I thought, it, yeah, yeah, but, but I'm doing this and I'm doing, yeah, but God's not counting against you. Did you know that? And if you'll receive his son, then he, see, he's already a friend with you. He wants you to become his friend now. By what? In other words, you, no, let's keep reading. Look at this. Now then, I'm an ambassador for Christ. I'm here. Did you know that God sent me to you? I'm here this, uh, on this street to, to, to tell you this good. I'm God's ambassador. I'm an ambassador for Christ as though God were pleading through me. I implore you on Christ's behalf. I'm standing here on behalf. I got great news for you. Be reconciled to God. Get back to God. He's already your friend. He's, he already paid for your sins. In fact, he's not keeping a record of them. Did you know that? Now listen, if you reject Jesus and you die and go to hell, you're going to know that Jesus had paid for all your sins. The sin that sends a person to hell is the sin of unbelief of rejection, uh, rejection of Jesus. The one sin that sends a person to hell is the sin of unbelief. That's what Jesus said. When the Holy Ghost comes, He's going to convict them of sin. Why? Because they don't believe in me. There you go. The sin that sends a person to hell is the sin of not believing in Jesus. And they're going to know that Jesus had actually paid for all their sins. It's still true. Whether they accept that forgiveness, whether they accept it or not, Jesus had paid for their sins. But the rejection of Him, of grace, rejection of the gospel of grace is a rejection, is what? Then it's judgment because you're not, God is, you're not a robot and God's not going to make you receive His love and grace or His forgiveness. So notice, he, and notice, how did He do it? But pastor, how can that be? Because He made Him Jesus on the cross. He took all your sin. He made him to be sin for you that you might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. So if you receive his forgiveness, if you receive the Lord Jesus, you become what? Right with God. He's already not counting your sins against you. See, a lot of people, they won't come to God because they're thinking, oh man, I can't come to church. I can't come to God. God's after me. Look at what I've done or whatever. But when you tell them the good news, listen, God is no longer counting your sins against you. Why? Because he already counted it up in his son. His son paid the price. Jesus bore all your, your, your sin. I remember Brother Hagen, he was reading this. In fact, uh, um, I don't know if you can put uh, verse 19 in the Amplified for me. Brother Hagen was reading the Amplified version of this, and he was, said he was sitting in his chair. It's in his little booklet, Paul's Gospel of Reconciliation. And he was sitting in his chair, and he said when he read this, it shook him. He said he actually went back and fell in his rocking, one of those soft chairs. And here's what he read. It was God personally present in Christ. Reconciling and restoring the world to what? Grace. There's grace right there. Favor with himself. Not counting up and holding against men their trespasses. But what? What was he doing? Oh, glory to God. See, you've got to understand at the cross, what, 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 your, your debt was being canceled at the cross. 
All your debts were canceled. Why? Because the code, the law, was nailed to the cross. Listen, canceling them, and he committed to us this message of reconciliation. Here's another definition of reconciliation. The restoration of favor. In other words, you have favor with God now. Amen? But pastor, if that's true, does that mean everybody is saved? No. Because they still have to receive the gift. They have to receive it. We don't teach universalism. There's people that teach universalism. Since it's all by grace, then that means everybody gets saved? No, 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 no. God is not going to make anybody receive his, his gift of salvation. It's a gift to be received. He will not force it you. Amen? And so, but listen, you had nothing to do, you had nothing to do with being born in sin. Did you ask to be born and then, and because of Adam's fault, be born in sin? Did you ask for it? Well, guess what? You had nothing to do with getting saved either. The only thing you have to do is receive. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. You were born once through your mama, but now you need to be born and fathered from above. You're, you were born physically through your mama, but now you need to be born spiritually from above. Are you seeing that? And so, and so, are you seeing that? So if somebody comes up to me, I don't know how many times I used to share this. And in fact, let's keep reading the next verse. Chapter 6. For he made him to be sin. But notice, this is still, this is still context here. Just because there's a chapter, the context is still together. Listen, we then, we then, as workers together with him, also plead with you. I'm still talking to them. Not to receive the grace of God in vain. Or in other words, don't let this gospel of the grace of God go to waste. That's one of the reasons I feel like I didn't need to get everybody as saved as much as I can. Why? Because I do believe that Jesus paid for everybody's sin and I don't want none of it to go to waste. Amen. That's why he says, hey, in an acceptable time I've heard you, God says, in the day of salvation I've helped you. Behold, I'm telling them, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Come on now, today. Today is the day of salvation. So, I'm, so you see how I'm, as, as, it's so simple. It's so simple to share this gospel with people. I'm just basically, again, it's there in your notes. Look at your notes there. What? God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. How? By not counting our sins against us. Jesus paid for our sins on the cross as our substitute and rose again as proof that we're forgiven. He became sin for us that we might become right with God. Why? Because of his love and his grace. Because of his love and his grace. Come on now. He loves you and he's not mad at you. He's not mad at you. Amen. In fact, the Bible says he's already your friend, but he wants you to become his friend too. In other words, he's, 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 he has his hands outstretched towards you to be his friend. If he was still angry with you, why would he, listen to me, if he was still angry with you, why would he extend his hand out? Pastor, can you prove it in the Old Testament? Yes. Isaiah 53 talks about what Jesus would do in the cross, but it's not in my notes. I want you to go to Isaiah 54. Look at this. Isaiah 54. It's not in your notes. Just write it down. You okay if I leave my notes a little bit? Those that like to be led by the Spirit, you should be, yeah, Pastor, that's good. You're being led now. Not just sticking with your notes. Be led, Pastor. Look at Isaiah 54. How many know God does things in context? Amen. Isaiah 53 is what Jesus did for us, but then Isaiah 54 talks about the new covenant. Because why? Because the cross. It's after the cross. So notice Isaiah 54, it talks about a perpetual covenant of peace. And notice, notice, check this out. I love this. Let's start in verse 4. Verse 4. And then we'll go up from there. Do not fear... For you will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced. You see, this is after the cross. For you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth. Come on, because of the cross, we get to forget the shame of our youth. And will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband. Come on, does Jesus become now our husband? Come on now, in the new covenant. The Lord of hosts is his name, and your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the, the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were refused, says your God. 
For a mere moment, I have forsaken you. Yeah, yeah, he had forsaken us for a mere moment. But with great mercies, I will gather you. With a little, listen, with a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. For this is, in fact, this covenant, this new covenant that God would form in the New Testament. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah will no longer cover the earth, so I have sworn, come on now, that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. For the mounts shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness, or his grace, shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of what? The gospel of grace is a covenant of peace. My covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has what? Who has mercy on you. Isaiah 53, what Jesus would do, the result, Isaiah 54, the new covenant of grace, where God said, I will not be angry with you anymore. So no, God's not mad with you. So I share with that, with a sinner, listen, Jesus paid, think of it, what? It would not be fair for God to be mad if Jesus already paid for it. See, people, this blows some people away. like Because they've heard so much religion. God's going to get you. God's mad at you. Now, pastor, doesn't, doesn't God get angry at sin? Well, yes, yes he does. Because it's a, but he does, again, he, he, he can get angry at the sin, but he's not the sinner. Because Jesus paid the price. He's angry at the sin, just like you get upset when one of your loved ones is doing, doing something really bad, it upsets you. Because you don't, why? Because sin destroys. Sin has consequences. It messes relationships. Amen? It tears up relationships or whatever. So there's consequences of sin. So yes, we, of course he doesn't like the sin. Amen? But you got to treat it like if you have a loved one that has cancer. You hate the cancer, but you still love them. That's how you have to look at it. God loves the sinner. He died for them. Yes, he hates what they're doing because it's destroying them. But God loves them. And so, how many, if you were a sinner, you're down and you, you've messed up so bad, and somebody comes to you and tells me, you know what? Man, I got some good news. Yeah, I know you messed up, you've done all this. But listen, God loves you. In fact, he loves you so much that God was in Christ restoring you to himself by dying on that cross, paying the price. He rose again, and now he's offering you this forgiveness. He's not counting your sins against you anymore. So why not just receive his grace right now? Why don't you receive it? Let Jesus be your Lord and Savior. See, I just gave you the gospel. So simple. We made it hard, and yet it's so simple. The gospel is so simple. Amen? And so, this is a simple gospel. In fact, I have a work, work thing that I'm going to give you in a little bit. Before we end, I'm going to give you a, a sheet that, that, I, that I'm going to give to you, and I'm going to explain it in just a little bit. So, are you seeing that? That's so easy. You can share this with anybody. Now, once you know that God was in Christ, what was he doing? Restoring you, the world to himself. How? By his death, burial, and resurrection. Not counting your sins against you. And all you have to do, and I'm here to tell you, he wants to be your friend now. He's already friends with you. In fact, one translated message says, he's already a friend with you. Why not be his friend? Come on, and that's why when people reject the gospel and they end up dying without Jesus, they're going to, to me, that's got to be the most miserable thought that I don't have to be here. Yes, I deserve to be here, but I don't have to be here because Jesus had paid the price. Amen. Right? Yes. Listen. This is the gospel of the grace of Christ. Galatians, and we're ambassadors. Notice, we're ambassadors of the grace of Christ, of the gospel. Galatians 1, 6 through 10. Galatians 1, 6 through 10. Paul says, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the what? In the grace of Christ to a what? Ha! Huh. Grace of Christ to a different... So what is the gospel? It's about the grace of Christ. If you don't preach about the grace of Christ, what are you doing? You're preaching a different gospel. Well, Pastor, Jesus preached about the kingdom. Well, yes, there is a kingdom coming. The kingdom, the kingdom of, uh, this, the, see, when Jesus was preaching about the kingdom, again, people forget 
he's talking to Jews. Jews don't understand the grace of God as far as the way we do today. Jews were just about, the, we know that the Messiah is supposed to come and he's supposed to rule and reign. So all they cared about was kingdom. So Jesus said, the kingdom of God is near you. And you know, there's a possibility that if they had accepted Jesus, we could have gone on to the kingdom. But Jesus says, it's left you because they rejected it. And so now the gospel of grace is being preached to the Gentiles. And then when Jesus raptures us up, then guess what the gospel is going to be again? About the kingdom. Because after seven years, Jesus is returning to what? For the kingdom millennial reign of a thousand years. And that's what Jews, that's all they, they heard prophecy about, that Jesus was going to rule and reign. So they're interested in the kingdom. Amen? Now, yes, when you get saved, you enter the kingdom, but if it's referring to the actual physical kingdom, that's not until the thousand year reign of Jesus. So we preach about the gospel of the grace of Christ. Notice what he goes on and says, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of what? Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be what? We already read. He said, I testify to the gospel of the grace of Christ. And we have, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. That's pretty strong language. I don't know about you, but I want to make sure that I'm preaching the gospel. I don't want to preach a different gospel. I better make sure I'm preaching the right gospel. Because there's a curse that comes on people that don't. That's what Paul said. If me, or even if an angel, well guess what? There's a man named what? Joseph Smith that had an angel and came and preached a different gospel. And if he had known the scripture, he should have looked at the scripture. If so, an angel comes and tells you a different gospel than what Paul and God gave to, to in the word of God, you better not accept it. See, because he didn't like the denomination of what was going on. Well, he got a different gospel, not the true gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the truth, people. Let's finish it up. Next verse. For, do I now seek to persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For I, if I still please men, I will not be above. Paul's saying, look, I'm not here to please people. I got to preach the gospel. It, but it's good news. The gospel is good news about what Jesus did for us. Now, now look at this. What was the result of this message of the gospel? Let's look at some examples real quick. Acts chapter 13, verse 38. Here's, the Paul's, here's Paul's first missionary journey. He's preaching the gospel, and the whole, I love the, thank God for the Holy Spirit, because he gave us an example of the gospel that Paul preached. In, in other words, Luke wrote down the message that Paul preached in this first missionary journey. Here it is. Paul's preaching the message of the gospel. Here's what he says. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached uh, to you uh, the forgiveness of sins, uh, He's preaching. And by him, everyone who believes is what? Justified or made righteous from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Is he preaching about the gospel of the grace of Christ? Yeah. Your salvation is by grace through faith. Listen, and, and notice, notice, but this sounded too good to be true to the law people. To the Jew, this sounds too well. Wait a minute. We're supposed to keep the... No, it sounds too good to be true. That's why he says, Beware therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. In other words, this good news of what Jesus has done, God's no longer mad at me. He loves me. He died for me. And he'll accept me if I just you know, give my life. Listen, you despisers, marvel and perish. For I'm going to work a work in your days. This is the gospel of the grace of God. A work which you will by no means believe. Why? It sounds too good to be true. The one word to declare it to you. Why? It's this gospel means too good to be true news. So then when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged. Notice, the Gentiles were excited. Oh, man, I don't have to try to keep the law. The Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, what did they say to them? Persuaded them to what? Continue in the grace. 
What, did he per what were they supposed to persuade him? Hey, guys, you started out in the grace of Christ. Continue in the grace of Christ. You were saved by grace through faith. Continue living your walk. See, a lot of Christians, they get saved by grace through faith, and then they get legalistic, and they get into the law. Now, when I preach like this, then people, Pastor, that means you know anybody can do anything? No. No. No, God still wants you to live a holy life. He's setting you free from yourself so that you could live a holy life. He's, in other words, because if it's based on you, then you're always trying to judge, am I living good enough? Do I, am, I, am I keeping the whole law? And you're focused on yourself. But when you realize you're already righteous, you're already holy, you're already set apart, you've already been washed with the blood, amen, you already belong, you, you, amen, you're already, you got Christ in you, then you, you, what? you begin living more holier by accident than trying to keep a bunch of rules and regulations. Amen. So look at, uh, where was I? Verse 45. Oh, on the next Sabbath, notice. Oh, this, see, this was good news. On the next, you can say the next service, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Now back to Brother Hagin's, and, and then we're going to read that in a little bit. Brother Hagin was sitting in his chair, and when he read that God's not counting people's sins against him anymore, he fell back. He got the revelation. He says, man, we haven't been preaching the gospel to people. Poor sinner, we've been telling them, you no good sinner, you better repent or God's not going to save you, whatever. You better get your life right. We're being beaten them over the head. He says, no, we need to tell them that God's not counting their sins against them anymore, that he wants to be their friend now. He's not mad at them anymore. Come on back home, man. Come back home to God. He's already your friend. Become his friend too. He said that. And you know what? There was another minister that asked Brother Hagin, how come you didn't, like, he had it in his book. It's in his book. But how come you didn't like push that that much? How come you didn't preach that that much? He said, that wasn't my assignment. His assignment was to teach people faith. And he told this minister, that's your assignment. And he knew because he had a difficulty just, get, just teaching faith. Brother Hagin had difficulty just preaching faith in churches. So he knew if he went in there and told people, God's not counting your sins against you, blah, blah, blah. He knew the reaction he was going to get from all the legalists. Same thing that I get sometimes because they think I'm preaching a, a loose gospel. Yeah. It's not a loose gospel. It's a free gospel. It's, it's, it sets you free from yourself. Yeah. Amen. Amen? I'm not giving people a permission to sin. They're already sinning without permission. <laughs> I'm trying to empower them to, get, to live free from that sin. You know what it shows me? If somebody hears the gospel, the grace of Christ, and understands who they are in Christ, and they're still living in sin, it just shows me they don't understand it yet. They haven't got the revelation of it. Why? Because they're focusing on self. Notice those grace gifts, that he might be glorified. He gets all the glory. That's why it's by grace. If it was your ability, then you would get all the glory. Same way with salvation, living the holy life. You, don't, you, can't, you can't glory that you live a holy life. He gets the glory. If you're living a holy life, it's because of Christ in you that you're living a holy life. It's His keeping power, His saving power, His saving grace, His keeping grace that keeps you. Amen? Pastor, can you sing another song? You're a little serious. Verse 45. Actually, yeah. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the thing. See, notice, the Jews got jealous of Paul. Why? Because everybody showed up to hear the gospel of the grace of Christ. They got jealous. Look at, but notice what happens, the result of grace. Go to verse 52, the result of preaching in that. And the disciples were filled with what? Joy. Sounds like Stephen, no? Sound like, uh, sound like uh, uh, Philip. They were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And look, 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 can we keep reading in context? Look at the next chapter. Go to chapter 14, verse 1. Chapter 14. Now it happened in Iconium. So they go to the next city. Here's the result of preaching the gospel of the grace of Christ. It happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and the Greeks, believed. So listen, the Jews and Greeks get saved? Yes, right? But notice, but 
Anytime you preach the grace of Christ, notice what happens. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. See, the enemy will come in and poison people's minds. Notice the result, though. Notice what Paul and, Paul and Barnabas did. Therefore, they stayed there what? That's why I preach on the grace of Christ so long, because some people still haven't gotten it. They stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was what? Bearing witness to the word of his what? What was God bearing witness to? I've given you more than three, four scriptures testifying to the gospel of the grace of Christ. What's God bearing witness to? This is a first missionary journey. Bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. That's why when you had, uh, uh, you know, we had Brian Essery here and whatever, he, he believes what I believe. It's the same thing. It's same, that's what he preaches. And he sees signs and wonders when he does his crusades out there and so forth. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews, part with the apostles. And see, not everybody's going to agree. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with the rulers to abuse and stone them, see, sometimes when you preach on the grace of God, some people might want to stone you. Maybe not stone you here, but maybe, you know, throw tomatoes or something. I don't know. They became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding region. So they left to go preach somewhere else. And they were what? Preaching, what were they preaching? The gospel there. Listen, that's very important. They were what? Preaching the gospel there. And in Lystra, check this out, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. Now, what were they doing in Lystra? They were, went to preach the gospel there. So they're preaching the gospel. This man heard what? Paul speaking. Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had what? Faith. What does it say? Faith. He had faith to be healed. Listen, you cannot have faith to be healed if you what? If you believe that God is counting your sins against you. How can you have faith to be healed if you believe that God's mad at you and he's out to get you? How can you have faith to be healed if you don't believe it's God's will for you to be healed? So what was Paul preaching in Lystra? The same message. It's through this man God was reconciling the world to himself. I'm sure that crippled guy was sitting there listening to Paul's message. He probably heard the religious teaching. Ah, oh, it must have been some sin. That's why you were born that way. Either some sin your mama did or some sin you did when you were in your mother's womb. <laughs> That's why you're crippled. Something you did. It's called your cripple. But he's hearing Paul preaching, listen. Oh no, he says, God was in Christ. He was reconciling you to himself. There he, he, God himself became a man, died on that cross for your sins, paid for every one of your sins, past, present, and future. He says, and, and he says, and he was buried, but on the third day he rose again as proof that he died in your place, that your sins are forgiven. God's not counting your sins against you. You don't have to be sick anymore. Remember Jesus? Remember Jesus in the Gospels when there was a guy in, 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 in his, with his bed and he was paralyzed? And Jesus said, rise up and walk. They said, huh, who does he think he is or whatever? And, and, he, and, and, they, and the, the Pharisees, whatever, who does he think he is? And, but, but he says, but then he told them, oh, you think that's something? Then he tells them, your sins are forgiven you. Why would he tell him that when he needed healing? Because if your sins are forgiven, then you can be healed. Yeah. If, if, there, if God is not keeping a record of your sins anymore, if God has nothing against you anymore, then you can receive healing, you can receive your deliverance, you can receive your finances, you can receive whatever it is. Come on, people. I am, I am preaching the gospel right now. He could not have faith to be healed if he thought that God was... So he's probably thinking, oh my God, they've been telling me that I was, because of sin, I was born this way. My, boy, my mama and my dad did. Amen? Brujeria, something happened. Amen? Yeah. So that's why I'm, you know, I'm cursed. But no, God's not, God's not mad at me. God's not counting any sin against me. And, and so Paul's looking at him. Notice, go back to the verse. Go back to where we were, last verse. 
The man heard Paul speaking. Paul observing him intently, and he seen that he had faith to be healed. So Paul, he probably, his eyes started, he could see it. This guy's ready. This guy's ready. He believes that he can be healed. So all of a sudden, notice what Paul said. He said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he what? He leaped. And he walked. Mm, glory to God. Amen? Maybe that's what you needed to tell the people today, hon. Stand up on your feet. I am a C. I am a C-H. I am a C-H-R-I-S-D-I-A-N. <laughs> and I got J-E-S-U-S and my A-H-R-T and I will L-I-V-E. L-I-V-E-E-T-E-R-N-A-L-L-Y. And I will live eternally. There you go. That was it. Right? Are you seeing that? The result of this gospel, of what I'm sharing with you? God doesn't justify you by the law. It's by His grace that He justifies you because of what Jesus did for you. A man who was crippled from birth, healing was the result. He had faith to be healed because he heard there's no way he could have faith to be healed if he thought, God's counting my sins against me. God's mad at me. God doesn't love me. You know, No, he heard the gospel, the good news of his love and grace. Amen? Amen? So how do we apply this? All these things that I've been sharing. When you understand that because of God's great love for you, he planned and purposed before time began for you to be in his grace, to grow in his grace, to share his grace, and to serve by his grace. It's, it will shoot adrenaline into your soul's that your life now has meaning and purpose. You were not an accident. Jesus Christ loves you and has forgiven you and is excited and, it's a, and it has an exciting and an awesome plan for your life in Him. So what are you waiting for? Receive all that He has for you. So I want to encourage you to get involved. Remember we talked about first ministering to one another with the grace gifts. Listen, get involved. We need We need drivers. We need ushers, we need greeters, we need, uh, the, you, know, the, you know, children's workers, nursery workers. We need, there's, you know, yeah. media. Amen? Amen? We need, we need, yeah, especially media. We need help there, live stream, camera. We need help. Use your gift, amen? You, maybe you're the behind-the-scenes person. You don't want to be, a, a, you know, in front. Well, we got plenty of stuff you can do. Amen? Or start, start a new one. How about a, a parking uh, entrance attendant? When people drive in, you wave at them. <laughs> Y'all come back now. Or wave them out. Y'all come back now, you hear? Bring a little... Dong, 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 dong. Just kidding. You know what I'm saying? How, be, how about be a, a greeter? Listen, the first people they see are the greeters. Or the security or whatever. And if you're like that, Welcome. I hope you enjoy <laughs> Pastor Manuel's songs. <laughs> now, can you, can you can, uh, uh, hand, pass them out to the ushers? And here's at least one for each couple. So, I don't like doing something and not equipping you. So here's what I did. I don't like doing something and not... And not and not equipping you. So what I did, check this out. I put, it's, it's two-sided, and I put five simple gospel messages. Five ways to share the gospel, right here, right in your hands. You can put it in your Bible. You find, to be honest with me, I like the one that I shared with you because it's so simple, it's so easy. All you do is read those scriptures. The word will not return void. It's going to be in them. That God was no, when you read the scripture, it's going to be in them. They're going to think about it. So, and if there's enough, then you can pass out the rest. So everybody, you know, if every couple got one and there's enough, you can pass out the rest. So that, that way, everybody has one to put there in their, in their Bible. Everybody, get, everybody got one that wanted one. Anybody else? How about in the back here? Anybody in the back wants one that didn't get one? Over here in the back. There's more in the back over here. Okay. Everybody get one? They wanted one? Now notice, there's two sides. Notice one side, the ABCs of salvation. 
or gospel outline. This is a little, more, a little bit more detailed, so if you have time to share with the person, you could use this as a guy. Basically, A. A what? Admit what? Admit that you have sinned because you're a sinner. Amen? Notice, because I'm reading, for everyone is a sin. We all short, fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God freely and graciously declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty of our sins. So it's based out of that scripture. And then B... So you, first you've got to get the person to first realize, yeah, you need a Savior. B, believe. Believe what? But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for our sins and, and while we were still sinners. I passed on to you, Paul said, what was most important that has also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the Scripture said. He was buried and He was raised. So what are you supposed to believe? Believe that Christ died for your sins. See those dots? Which means you're forgiven. Believe that he was buried, which means he took your old life. And believe he was raised, which means he gave you a new life. And then notice the, the, the third one, confess. And that's Romans 10, 9, 10. If you confess the Lord Jesus. And so, and so it's got the ABCs. So believe, admit, believe, and confess. But notice, if you look down there after the prayer, now what? I put you extra things. It, go, it, goes with, it keeps on with the letters. D, discover what? According to Romans 12, to discover who you are in Christ. E, establish, Ephesians 3, 17, establish yourself in God's love. F, fellowship, uh, find a local church family to grow with. G, give, give of your time, talent, and treasure. H, help, help share this gospel of grace. I, identify, identify publicly to your faith in water baptism. So it gives you a little guide, but listen, this is fine, but turn to the other side. I like the ones on the, to be honest with you, I like the ones on the other side better. Remember the, the one I shared with you this morning? There it is. The simple grace message based on 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 6, 2. Again, what? God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. How? By not counting our sins against us. Jesus paid for our sins at, on the cross as our substitute and rose again as proof that we are forgiven. He became sin for us that we might become right with God. Why? Because of his love and grace. He loves you. Be his friend. Now, how many know heard of the Roman road? The Roman road. Anybody heard of the Roman road to salvation? Basically, you take all the scriptures from the book of Romans and you share the gospel from it. It's right there in your notes. So, all have sinned and fall short, Romans 3.23. The penalty of sin is separation from God, Romans 8, 20, uh, I mean 6.23. God's love sent Jesus to die for us, Romans 5.8. 5, 5, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection saves us, Romans 5.10. Calling upon Jesus will save you today, Romans 10, 13. Peace, no condemnation, and love from God is the result, Romans 5, 1, and Romans 8, 1. So that's all what? The, go, it's the Roman road, the Roman road to salvation. Now, this one is a, this one's a little bit different. You may not have heard of this one. I like this one too. It's a little bit simple, but let me, let me go through it with you. This one is, is do or done. And this is not original with me. It's from Bill Hybels, but listen to what he says. Do, I, in other words, I only have so much time to deal with somebody, so I'm, I'm telling you, you know what, what, what church or what Jesus, God is? It's about do or done. Religion is spelled D-O because it consists of the things people do to try to somehow gain God's forgiveness and favor. But the problem is that you never know when you've done enough. It's like being a salesman who knows he must meet a quota but never being told what it is. You can never be sure that what you're actually done when you've actually done enough. Worse yet, the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that we can never do enough. We all always fall short of God's perfect standard. But true religion or true Christianity is spelled D-O-N-E, done. But thankfully, Christianity is spelled differently. It is spelled D-O-N-E, which means that when we could never, what we could never do for ourselves, Christ has already done for us. He lived the perfect life we could never live, and He willingly died on the cross to, say, to pay the penalty we owed for the wrongs that we've done. And there's those scriptures I shared with you. To become a real Christian is to humbly receive God's gift of forgiveness and to commit to following His leadership. When we do, then, we, then He adopts us into His family and begins to change us from the inside out. But listen, I added the last D, decide. I felt like you needed to get him to a decision. So, considering all that Jesus has done for you, why not make a decision to call and receive him as your Lord and Savior? And there's the scriptures. But now, 
Look, there's one more in the bottom there. There's a one verse. One verse. You can share the gospel in one verse in Romans 6.23. Amen? For the wages of sin. And you can draw it on a piece of paper. Put, put, a, put it like a, a platform here, like a canyon. You know what? You have a canyon like this. Put a plat, draw on a piece of paper, like one side of the canyon, and then the, the, the canyon area, and then the other side. Right? And then you share the scripture. For the wages of sin on this side is what? Death. Sin, we've all sinned, and sin has its wages, and its wages is death. But what you do, you draw a cross to form a bridge across the canyon. But the gift of God, what? Is what? Eternal life. How? Through Jesus Christ. Right? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So, listen, we're here. As sinners, we're over here. But God provided a way to get through our, our you know, canyon, our, our, this cliff, and hell is below, you could say, but you know, you don't want, it depends how dramatic you want to be. You can put fires and, and it's a, <laughs> you don't want to burn, you don't want to fall in the canyon. So, for the wages of sin is what? Death, but God provided a way through the cross, through his son, that you could have what the gift, notice, wages, gift, wages, gift. Sin gives wages. God's gift, that's grace. The gift of God is eternal life. through Jesus. So you see what I'm saying? I gave you five simple ways that you can share the gospel. Find the one that you like, or because of time you might have, you might be able to go through the Romans. Follow the one that you need. Amen? Follow the one that, that'll, that'll be good for you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your word, Father. I know we're out of time, but Father, I want to pray for, if there's anyone here that, or watching that you have never, I've already preached the gospel, so if that's you watching or if you're here and you've never received Jesus, I want to lead you in a simple prayer to receive Jesus. And listen, if, and I'm not, not going to ask you to come up, but just right there where you're at. If that's you, raise your hand and I'll pray with you. If that's you, if you've never received Jesus in your life, if that's you, raise your hand. Or if there's anyone watching too, Raise up your hand if you right there where you're at, and we will pray with you. Amen. Listen, we're going to say this together. I want uh, let's all say this together. Father God, Father God I, come you, I come before you, and I admit, and I admit that, I sinned, that I have sinned and come short of your glory. And I am sorry, but I've heard your good news that you're not counting my sins against me. That Jesus died on that cross, took all my sins, and he was buried. But on the third day he rose again as proof that he paid the price for me. Lord Jesus, I receive you now into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I accept you. As my gift gift. from Father God. God. From this day forward, forward, I make a decision decision to live for you you. by grace, grace. through faith. faith. Thank you you. for making me a new creation, creation. for changing my life. life. In Jesus' name, name. Amen. 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 If you did that, let us know. And if you're watching, if you prayed that prayer, please let us know and we will give you, get you some information and so forth. What is this, hon?